Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. If your child has a congenital heart defect, it means that they were born with a structural problem of the heart, a problem that changes the normal flow of blood through the heart. Now, there are many types of congenital heart defects, and they range from simple defects with no symptoms to complex defects with life-threatening symptoms. Mm -hmm. Congenital heart defects are the most common type of birth defect, and I didn't realize that. They affect eight out of every 1,000 newborns, and each year in the United States, more than 35,000 babies are born with a heart abnormality. 35,000. In some cases, doctors can find these problems during pregnancy, but in other cases, symptoms may not even occur until adulthood. Congenital heart defects can be simple and don't require any treatment or are easily fixed, but others that are more complex may require multiple surgeries performed over a period of several years. Here to discuss congenital heart defects is the Chair of Cardiovascular Surgery at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Joseph Duraney. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Duraney. It's great to see you. It's great to be back, and thank you for the invitation. Dr. Duraney, always great to see you. Great to have you on the program. This sort of sounds like, uh, from a surgical standpoint, not something that a rookie can do. Tell our audience how long it took you to learn how to do what you do. That's a great. Uh, that's a great point, Tom. <laughs> it was. It wasn't that long ago either. <laughs> yeah. The actually the 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 demands for postgraduate training for congenital heart surgery is probably the longest of any um, subspecialty in surgery, period. Uh, it requires uh, basic training, which usually starts in general surgery, then thoracic and cardiac. Now this is after medical school. This is after medical school. <laughs> and Unfortunately, after the medical school. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, college and medical school doesn't count uh, in the in the tally of years, but wow. um, but general surgery and the, and the format of general surgery programs and how thoracic surgery is incorporated is, is sort of continues to evolve. But we're talking about you know five to seven years of general and thoracic and cardiovascular surgical training, followed by usually one, and in some cases some people uh, elect to do two years of training in pediatric or congenital heart surgery. So we're talking about seven, eight, nine years after medical school to dive into this specialty. So how old were you when you started, when you actually got a job? Seven. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, you can't look at it like that. I, mean, well, I, know, I know that, yeah. but yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's important for the audience to know what, what it takes to do, do what you do and to be a, a, a cardiac surgeon. And it takes a long, it takes a long time, unfortunately. There's no shortcuts. It's a it's technically demanding. Intellectually, it's 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 quite challenging, um, and uh, and so you know it requires a, a real level of commitment and dedication that uh, you know that needs to be appreciated from the beginning. Uh, but be you like what you do. I love what I do, and you do it every day, and and. Keep and coming back to work. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so this is heart defects are the most common of all birth defects. Didn't realize that. So uh, although they're uncommon overall, uh, you must see a lot. We see a lot. Of course, it, they get clustered at various centers that are providing treatment options for these children. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is common. But I think the most important thing, when people think of congenital defects that children are born with, Oftentimes, that there's an associated thought that the outlook is not very promising, when in fact, with, with congenital heart disease, the outlook and the promise for a, a really wonderful future is generally the rule for most of these children. So um, it can be stressful in the beginning, and sometimes more than one operation or more, one, more than one intervention may be necessary. But, you know, at the end of the road, I mean, the quality of life for the vast majority of these children is, is generally very, very good. They can go to school. They can get jobs. They can be functional members of society in a very meaningful way. So, But this wasn't always true, right? No. No, it wasn't always true. I mean, once the, once the advances in cardiac surgery, you know, came to fruition, I mean, now we can provide, you know, treatment for even the most complicated congenital heart defects even in the newborn period, that is within the first month of life, and get them back on track. What you, causes these congenital heart defects? Well, actually, uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and it's probably one of the most common questions I get from a parent because oftentimes there's concern sure. that they did something wrong. And the fact of the matter is, is that most of these defects, there is no known cause, probably 80 to 90% of them. 
for those where there is a cause, it could be related to alcohol or drug abuse during the course of pregnancy, which fortunately is very, very rare. And I would remind people that not just a random glass of wine probably did not contribute to it. Um, there can be um, some odd viruses like rubella can, you know, can be associated with, um, with the development of congenital heart defects. There are some medicines uh, that can also contribute to it. Mm -hmm. And if you're getting the appropriate prenatal care, um, there, you know, there should be, you should fall in the category of the unknown as opposed to an, an absolute cause that could have been avoided had one known. Is there a most typical or most often diagnosed defect, like uh, with the areas of the, the heart, heart or, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the hole in the heart the, or the... My favorite, the valves. <laughs> yeah, well, the, mo the most common ones are holes in the heart, um, for sure. And, and valves are probably second on the list. But there is often a combination of holes and valves that are abnormal as part of one, one defect. Mm. But holes by themselves would be the most common, you know, would be the most common um, abnormality. So is there are four chambers in the heart, and when you talk about a hole uh, in the heart, you're talking about a hole between... Either the, the receiving chambers or the pumping chambers, yeah. yes. How yeah. often are these genetic? Yeah, genetic would be the other, um, would be the other um, category of explanation for it, and, uh, and that still ends up being relatively uncommon. I think the common question that parents will ask is if they have a child with a congenital heart defect, what are the chances that they're going to have yet another child with it? And while the odds go up slightly, they don't go up dramatically. There are certain defects that have a known genetic linkage, but that is a very, very small fraction when you look at the whole array of congenital heart defects. So how are most of these picked up? When are they discovered? Well, many of them are discovered prenatally with routine ultrasonography that is done on mom prior to you know delivery, which is usually at the 18-week 18 to 20 weeks, many, most of the anomalies, can, at least the important, the serious ones that may require intervention are picked up then. So the ultrasound is that good that oh. it can actually not just see a little something that looks like the heart, it can tell you that there's something wrong with the heart. It can. Amazing. Which and explains why before we had the ultrasound developed to the level that it is now, so much of this went undiagnosed until the, after the child was born. That's right. And in some situations when it's a very concerning defect, arrangements could be made for the delivery in a very controlled manner in a center that can deal with it right after birth because some of these defects require attention right after delivery. You sometimes do that? I mean, take a baby straight to the OR after they're born? It's, it's the exception rather than the rule, but there are some situations where something, not necessarily OR, but it may be an intervention, um, you know, a, a catheter-related um, intervention that is done within the first 24 hours of life. So what's it like operating on a one-month-old child? I mean, do you have magnifying glasses or? Uh, <laughs> it's pretty. It's it's pretty customary for for surgeons to wear loops, magnifying glasses when they're operating. And and uh, yes. How yeah. big is the heart in a in a child that age? It, well, months I think old. A, a, a golf ball size, give or take. It depends on the anomaly. Some of the anomalies will result in a heart that's slightly enlarged, and some maybe slightly smaller. But that's would be kind of a rough, you know, the old the old you know saying it's about the size of you know, your fist um, is, is probably not far off. I mean, for a baby, maybe it would be uh -huh. slightly bigger, but it gives you kind of just a general reference point. You referenced the ones that, or you mentioned the ones that you find with uh, uh, ultrasound. What about after the child has been born? What are the symptoms that you might discover then? Well, the most common symptoms right when they're first born, the first would be blueness. I mean, if they were blue when they were born, uh, that will really prompt an investigation to exclude congenital heart disease because most, most often the explanation is going to be a structural defect with the heart as opposed to a lung problem. You know, beyond that, it would be a murmur. Um, most, most structural defects in children result in some aspect of heart failure which in a child is manifested as breathing very rapidly. Um, and then it, this wouldn't be appreciated right after birth, but the inability to gain weight properly is also can be a reflection of congenital heart disease where you know, all the blood flow is being redirected toward the lungs and they just don't gain weight. We call that failure to thrive. And how do you figure out exactly what is wrong? Well, an echocardiogram will uh, you know, answer the question 99 plus percent of the time. So 
ultrasound of the heart um, by a by a talented group of pediatric cardiologists that do this all the time can get exquisite detail about the defects and then in selected circumstances would you complement an echo with either a cardiac catheterization or a CT scan something like that to confirm or to clarify something that may be a little confusing on the echo and when do you uh, make the decision that they need surgery? I assume that there are some of these defects that don't need surgery or can be treated with something other than an operation? Mm -hmm. So some defects can be treated uh, percutaneously with a catheter, usually when they get bigger. Um, and then it, it's pretty clear, you know, in the textbooks, you know, the timeline for intervention with, with the majority of these defects. Some defects, it's, it's essential that you do surgery in the first week of life. Other defects, it's important that you do it in the first six to nine months of life. Other defects, you may intentionally wait until they get a little bit bigger. And all of this has to do with risk related to surgery. Sometimes defects, um, the risk becomes lower when they get bigger and older. Uh, and then some, you know, untoward consequences like, you know, improper brain development because of extreme blueness you might be intervening much earlier to correct that problem. Is that why it, some heart um, defects can take multiple surgeries? Yeah. Some, some, some defects require a, a staged approach to operations. Some things you can do in the newborn period and some things you can't do until they get older. So there are temporizing procedures that you do to get them to the next stage, so to speak. Um, and, of course, the ideal lesion is one where you fix it once and they're done and, and it would be unlikely that they're going to need um, an intervention. But, importantly, they still will probably need oversight and surveillance. All right. We're talking about congenital heart defects with the chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery at Mayo, Dr. Joe DeRaney. Time for a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about... Robot-assisted heart surgery, oh making goodness. some surgeries less invasive. Amazing what you do, Dr. Durrani. I can't wait to hear more. Thanks much. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are with the chair of the Division of Cardiovascular Surgery at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Joe Durrani, and we've been talking about congenital heart defects, but... Now a new topic. Yeah, robots. Oh, oh, How about that? Yeah. Robots in the operating room, Dr. Durrani, is that, it's no longer science fiction. It is here to stay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've talked about babies, now we're talking about robots that uh, have the ability to do amazing things from a cardiac surgery standpoint. Well, I can imagine, to link the two together, Dr. Shives was pointing out, an infant's heart is the size of their little fist, it's so tiny. Um, a robotic-assisted surgery, I would think, would be really beneficial in that case. Well, unfortunately, th there does need to be a certain size of the patient oh, okay. for the robot to fix because the arms of the robot need to fit in the chest cavity to mm -hmm. be actually be able to do it. So it's not ready for infants and very small children. But when you get into the teenage years, there is a role for it for selected lesions. And I think this is the, this is the message for, I think, the, 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 the listener is that while the, the public is interested in all their operations, regardless of what type it is to be done through the smallest possible incision, we do have the capability to do that in cardiac surgery, but it is for a relatively short list of procedures. Mm -hmm. It's not for every procedure. And, and sometimes you know, patients get disappointed when they find out that they need heart surgery and then the robot's not applicable. But for the lesions that it is, it is a wonderful way to approach it. Well, give us an example of when you could use the robot. And well, the, most common, uh, the most common indication would be mitral valve disease, which is one of the valves inside the heart on the left side um, becomes leaky, and it needs to be repaired. And uh, the robotic approach is, is really beautiful for this because it can be done with a very small, a three-centimeter incision. And um, we, we duplicate the identical operation that we would be doing open. So we've not compromised, we've not cut any corners in terms of the operation that is being offered. We do the same operation, but we're able to do it through a very small incision. So what, what does that mean? You are at a console, and then there are little hands over there, or yeah. robotic hands that you control? So it requires, actually, a very cohesive team. Um, there is a console that sits in the corner of the operating room where, the, where one surgeon will drive the, the, the arms of the robot, and you use both hands and both feet when you're doing this. 
Well, it's like flying an airplane. It is. It's yeah. like it's like being in a cockpit. And then at the bedside, there is a, a number of people around the patient at the bedside, and everybody has a very defined role. And there are two people that are right around the arms of the robot. So through the small incision, one of those a surgical assistants, another surgeon, is passing the needles and the sutures and the rings or whatever it is that we're using through this keyhole that then the arms of the robot are then doing the surgery. And so it does require an orchestrated, sort of perfectly choreographed, you know, um, um, group of people that are used to working together. The main reason to do this is so the smaller incision for the heart, is that the only reason or the main reason? So the first is cosmetic. Of course, the incision is a small incision and it's on the side, so there's nothing visible in front. There are other very small incisions, kind of like the size of a pen, where the arms of the robot go in. So the first would be cosmetic. The second would be it's, it's less invasive, so the risk of infection is lower. The chances of needing a blood transfusion are lower. And importantly, the recovery from surgery is quicker. So not only is their length of stay in the hospital shorter, usually three to four days instead of five to seven days, the total recovery is two to four weeks where they can be back to work as opposed to six to eight weeks. And so their time away from work and their participation back into society is all accelerated. So there are many advantages with uh, the robotic approach. Structurally getting at the heart, I mean, it just has to be a ton easier to do all those little bitty incisions. Well, it is for certain problems. Like, for example, it's difficult to do, you know, the common operation of coronary bypass grafting. That would be difficult to do with the robot. Now, if you only have one bypass graft that you need to do, there is a way to do it. But if you're doing multiple grafts, mm -hmm. you can't get to the left side and the front and the right side all through one little incision on the side of the chest. So this is where there's some confusion. It's, it's very, very good for certain things, but it's, it's, it's just not possible for other things. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. Um, so the uh, recovery is significantly quicker. The, the cosmetically, you've got a small incision instead of having your chest cracked, right? right. Um, but what about the results and the time it takes to do the operation? Yeah, that's a very good point. So it actually does take a little bit longer to do the operation. Now, when I say longer, I should say that the total time in the operating room, the actual surgical time, and in cardiac surgery, the important time um, the important times that are monitored are how long you're on the heart-lung machine and how long the heart is stopped. And once you get through the learning curve, at least in our experience, those times are not that different than when you do it open. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on before that and after that. For example, the anesthesia preparation and, and the different blocks that they do for pain control. And then after you're done, they wake the patient up, try to get the breathing tube out. There's a lot of non-surgical things that go on in the operating room that keep the patient away from their family for a longer duration of time. But the actual operating time is, is initially longer, but once you have a seasoned team, the times can be very similar to what they are for open surgery. And maybe one day you'll be able to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit tired. Say to the robot, you take this one. <laughs> <laughs> what else is new in heart research? Heart I, I think, you know, um, a couple things come up. Stem cell uh, therapy mm -hmm. uh, and stem cell therapy um, um, just in general is the ability to take a patient's own cells, usually retrieved from the bone marrow, separate them out to the very, very early precursor cells that have the ability to develop into whatever cells you want, re-injecting them into the heart at the time of a heart operation to improve the function of the heart. This gets at the big family of heart failure which of course is rampant in the United States, people dying from heart failure. So whether it's a congenital defect like we talked about or an acquired defect, coronary artery disease, any situation where the function of the heart is going below normal, there is a lot of enthusiasm and hope that stem cells will actually have the ability to improve the function of the heart. So that would be one thing. And then catheter-based procedures. I mean, we're talking about robotic and minimally invasive surgery, but there is a lot of movement going toward even beyond robots and small incisions to total catheter-based therapy, which cardiologists and surgeons are working on together. And we have a lot of that going on at the Mayo Clinic. It's all intriguing. We've been talking about congenital heart defects and robotic-assisted surgery with the chair of the Division of Cardiovascular Surgery at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Joe Durini. Dr. Durini, so great to have you on the program. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me.